So coming back to our discussion, this is, uh, this is a male with uh, metastatic uh, colorectal cancer with microsatellite uh, instability. So coming to you, Greg, for this, uh, you know, we've discussed this through the different cases, but tell me about the MSI testing. Uh, uh, what, what are the different ways that MSI can be tested in colorectal cancer? Yeah, so, so I mean, you know, traditionally the, the, the two ways would be you know, typically what people would call the, you know, the, the MMR testing, which typically refers to the immunohistochemistry, looking for the four uh, mismatch repair proteins and see, seeing if any of those were lost. Uh, and then the alternative would be you know, so-called MSI testing, which is kind of a, a readout for uh, deficiency in one of the mismatch repair proteins, so MSI or microsatellite instability testing. And traditionally, that, that was uh, done with a, a, a NCI recommended panel of either you know, five or six genes. And if, if uh, two or more of those were altered, uh, they would be considered MSI high. So in, in the, the alteration, that the, the panel's essentially looking at uh, three mononucleotide repeats and, and two dinucleotide repeats, and that's wh where you see the defect when you uh, lose uh, the mismatch repair proteins. Now with uh, some of these larger uh, NGS-based uh, tests, they're, they're also able to look at, at similar uh, microsatellite regions and, and do their own calculations, actually with, with even, you know, I, I think Foundation Medicine does like, you know, 90, uh, actual uh, uh, loci to, to look to test for, for MSI. So. so right now, uh, Richard, what do you, in your uh, clinical experience, what do you send it out for? Do you send it out for an IHC? Do you look at the NGS? What do you use for uh, determining the MSI? I think the turnaround time for MMR is the quickest, is IHC. It takes two or three days. Um, NGS takes longer, anywhere from two to three weeks. So ideally, if I want to get the, uh, get the answer back very quickly to determine the patient candidate for immunotherapy or not, I would do MMR testing, which is very quick, which can be done internally. So what do you, uh, when do you think, uh, do you test along with that, do you test for pdl one in these colorectal cancer patients? So in both of the trials, uh, particularly the Checkmate 142, this has actually been looked at, and there's no impact of pdl one positivity on response rates, so there's no reason to check it. And which one do you check in your clinical practice? Do you do like an MMR? Do you do the uh, IHC testing or do you do more, con more with NGS? Um, so typically we start with IHC. It's, as Richard pointed out, it's the quickest uh, way to achieve that. I guess the question that I have for Greg as a pathologist is that should you do both? Should you do MMR, IHC, and MSI? Or should you, if you have MMR deficient, is that it? Or should you do, you know, so most, deficient, I is think, that I think, it? I think most, most places, you know, as you, you said, actually do the immunohistochemistry up front, front for, you know, two reasons. You know, the one is it's a faster turnaround time, and then actually it's, it's, less, it's uh, less expensive um, as well. And, and the, the sensitivities are generally reported to be similar, you know, around 92 or 93 percent for, uh, you know, detecting uh, um, microsatellite instability. They, they both have, you know, reasons they, they could potentially fail, but I think most, most places, most institutions I've been at typically do uh, the mismatch repair protein immunochemistry, you know, up front, and then if, if there's some uh, equivocal result, then, th then they might think of, of doing, you know, MSI as a, as a, as a, through a secondary mechanism. So in these ones that it comes, Richard, do you then send them for germline testing that it shows up? If, yes, if there's a strong family history, if the patient's young, you know, we do have a genetic counselor that we have to send the patient to. So those, yes, in, in, the, in those cases, to make sure if it's lynch or non lynch we, that's, that'll be next step. One, one other thing I'd like to chime in with that. So I think, I think most institutions are typically uh, doing, uh, especially if it's the, the loss of the, the MLH1, so the, you know, the sporadic uh, uh, mismatch repair deficient colon cancers, they actually typically have hypermethylation of uh, the MLH1 gene as opposed to a germline mutation. Uh, and it's been found that um, about 75% of those uh, have a BRAF in the sporadic, have a BRAF E600E mutation. So a lot of people are actually testing uh, when MLH1 uh, is lost uh, for um, BRAF E600E. And if, that, if that's mutated, uh, th then you know it's sporadic. If it's not mutated, you know, then it could go either way. Yeah, that's correct. So BRAF is done automatically. Basically. Now, I was going to point out Richard's comment about sending somebody to a genetic counselor, uh, even, even with uh, the information about this case, uh, is important because you have a family history of breast cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer. That does not usually make you think uh, Lynch syndrome. It makes you think perhaps a BRCA right. mutation. Right. Um, so, and it's possible there's more than one mutation in the family. So I don't think we can just stop at the fact that this person uh, has Lynch syndrome. There, there may be other reasons mm -hmm. for other family members. They may have other mutations, perhaps. And so um, it's gotten complex enough, I think, beyond what 
we as medical oncologists can really handle now. Right. And but I think the important takeaway from this case is that really you should be asking about family history. That's a very important factor to talk to our patients about their family history and they should be a good intake of the family history because that can pick up clues on when we can test them for additional things and send them to genetic testing. And uh, tell me this, uh, Greg, what about tumor mutational burden? We are hearing more and more and more about it, morely, mostly in the lung literature. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about what is tumor mutational burden? How does it differ from MSI, from PDL one testing? Yeah, so it, it's kind of, it, it's obviously, as you said, uh, kind of another emerging um, potential marker for uh, you know, lung cancer, uh, melanoma, um, you know, potentially colon cancer, um, but but essentially it, it's just looking at the uh, the number of mutations typically per per megabase, and um, a, a lot of this was done on on uh, uh, cancer genome atlas uh, data initially, and then um, different because uh, the way that testing was done, a, a lot of companies are trying to then translate that into, as opposed to doing whole exome sequencing to more targeted panels where you, know, you, you may only have a, a megabase of coverage, but essentially looking at the number of mutations uh, per megabase and you know, with, with certain tumors, there, there's a correlation uh, you know, with response to immunotherapy. With you know, the, the MSI, there, there tends to be high concordance between uh, tumors that are mismatch repair de deficient uh, and, and tumors that have high, high tumor mutation burden. So Mike, are you using tumor mutation burden in your practice? Um, no, because it, it's not been uh, validated, validated for, for colorectal. Um, and so far, the checkpoint molecules only have a, appear to have activity in microsatellite instability high and not microsatellite stable. So until that data is available, we, we're not using it.